Greetings, Master Gardeners. Welcome to our first shelter in place, Open Garden. This is a great way to spend the time on a sunny fall afternoon. We hope that some of you would like to share your gardens in 2021. Please contact Jenny Piazza or I if you were so inclined. I would like to thank Bruce Gorin for sharing his garden and also Peggy Lynch for being our tech person today and Laura Maharis for um, monitoring and leading our chat room. Uh, you see all your instructions on uh, the Zoom tour, the, uh, the previous slide. And uh, if you have chat questions, uh, please enter them into the chat box and Laura will, um, Laura and Bruce will um, uh, make arrangements uh, for you to share the questions and for Bruce to answer them. And now let me introduce Bruce Gorin. You are in for a real treat today. Thank you, Cynthia. I hope I can live up to that. So let's move on to our very first slide as I welcome you to my garden. Uh, I would have preferred to have you uh, all join me via live video, but my Wi-Fi doesn't reach into the backyard. So we're gonna have to go do this by slide. So, so where am I? Uh, uh, we're in the Excelsior District, which is a, the very Southern part of uh, San Francisco city and county. And uh, we're in what we call the fog transition zone in the Excelsior. You can see that little uh, orange uh, point that I dropped on the map. Uh, the peninsula is divided by, uh, I think it was Pam Pierce who introduced this concept and we learned it as master gardeners into three zones. Uh, they take the sunset 17 zone and chop it up three ways. So along the coast, uh, on the west side, uh, in the avenues is the fog zone. Uh, in the middle of the peninsula is the fog transition zone. That's where I live and uh, often you can look straight up and see the the turbulent interaction of the dry air from the interior, moist air from the coast. And then uh, on the, uh, the easternmost uh, side of San Francisco, uh, it's much more like uh, uh, down in San Mateo County, what we call the sun zone. So uh, more specifically, uh, we're uh, on Ney Street. Uh, we're just two blocks away from the 280 freeway uh, out where it uh, branches off. If you've ever been on the 280 North and you and you get to that uh, branching point between the, the 280 and the 101, that's uh, real close to where we live. I dropped a thumbtack on our yard, and you can see that uh, it's about the same size as, as that of all our neighbors. Most of our neighbors let their yards go fallow, uh, oxalis wilderness, I like to call them. But uh, you can see a couple doors down, someone's got some nice raised beds. My backyard neighbor's got a jungle of fruit trees and uh, but for the most part, I've got the only real cultivated uh, backyard. So our backyard is uh, 26 by 60. Uh, here's a little schematic of uh, the setup. We've got uh, a porch coming off uh, the second story of the house and stairs leading down to the ground level garden. And I'm going to take you on a tour uh, starting uh, from this uh, uh, south east corner. And we're going to go counterclockwise around the garden, and uh, I've got some uh, some larger uh, schematics to uh, share with you, so you can see exactly what we're going to get into. But uh, for our neighborhood, this is a pretty typical size. Uh, when you get closer to downtown, these yards get chopped approximately in half. If you know people who live closer to uh, downtown, but in the outskirts of San Francisco, this is pretty typical. Up in the house, in the next room over from where I'm sitting right now, I've got uh, a tiny little uh, grow room, so to speak, where I start uh, all my uh, vegetable seedlings indoors. Uh, I start them semi-hydroponically. Uh, I've got a uh, setup where uh, I've got uh, 50 plug trays. I use either coconut core or, uh, or a Canadian uh, sphagnum peat pots, all with little indentations and uh, I use a, a hydroponic solution that I mix myself from some stuff I bought uh, online. And uh, the, uh, the tray is, is heated with a seed heating mat. And uh, you also see this little airline tube. This goes to a, uh, an aquarium pump so I can uh, aerate, oxygenate the roots as, uh, as things grow. And uh, this is a little setup from a time-lapse movie that I made a couple of years ago. 
Uh, you'll also notice I've got blackout curtains because I've got powerful pink LED lights. Uh, a few years ago, Kelly and I were driving on the freeway before I put these uh, these blackout curtains up and we could see uh, our home from about five miles away like a great big pink Batman beacon. And we realized that unless uh, unless we want the uh, the DEA helicopters descending on our house, we better put up blackout curtains. We're not growing any cannabis, but you know, you know how neighbors are, they see those lights and they're gonna drop a dime on you. Up on the porch is uh, where I keep my, uh, my nursery, so to speak. So after we've started seedlings indoors uh, for a day or two, I'll move them outside to uh, harden off, get used to the uh, more direct sun, even though the uh, LEDs are quite intense. That's where I'll, uh, I'll put my rooted cuttings. Uh, here you see a, a babaco cutting uh, that I'm rooting on the porch. And uh, this was taken a few years ago. This was actually auctioned off during one of our, uh, our uh, holiday party events uh, two years ago, I believe. This larger picture on the right uh, shows you uh, where I'm also growing out uh, grafted saplings. I'm kind of obsessive about sprouting the seeds of some of the rarer fruit trees that I grow. And uh, most fruit trees, as you probably know, don't come true to the parent when you uh, plant them by seed. What you need to do is graft on a known good variety. And you can see very clearly the graft union here has healed as I've scraped away some of the latex and, uh, and, uh, and wax film to, uh, to show you that that healing process has moved along very nicely on that particular sampling. We also have a great big pot of uh, what we call cat grass, which is uh, really uh, like winter wheat for the kitties. They love their veggies. And a couple of fun pots of uh, carrots and things for the grandkids. Bruce? Yes. Someone asks, is that a graft on a graft? Uh, no, uh, the, but that's a good observation. What you're looking at there is a second graft on a, on a failed graft. So the reason that you've got that, uh, if I can go back to that slide, let's see. The reason you've got that little uh, elbow at the bottom is that the original graft failed. And so I cut off the bad graft and allowed a new sprout to come from the, uh, the rootstock and then grafted a second time, this time successfully on that. Very, uh, very keen observation from your questioner. So here we are in the, uh, in the part of the garden that's closest to the house. And we're gonna start at this uh, southeast corner and uh, move out towards the back. Uh, you're gonna see my rain barrels where my mushroom bed used to be. I've got a new mushroom bed that's now directly underneath the porch. You can see that if you go to my Instagram account at SF Fruit Gardener. And then we'll look at my shard, apricot, tree, avocado, patanga, and guava as we start moving around the garden. So I just put these in. Uh, I am probably the world's worst uh, concrete and stone mason. And so the, the, the first challenge was to uh, to get a good platform for these uh, rain barrels, which I installed. Uh, Kelly found these online. Apparently the city of San Francisco has a, a program where uh, if you uh, qualify by living in the city, uh, being a homeowner and being under a certain income level, uh, they will give you one or two of these uh, beautiful 55 gallon rain barrels for free, along with the tools that you need to install them. So the package came with the special hole cutting saw that you attach to a drill to get into the downspout. It comes with the pipes that you need and, uh, and all this, all the little uh, valves and things. Uh, so this is our first year with the rain barrels. You'll notice that I've got the lids inverted here. Uh, that's because they had the, uh, the manufacturer had stuffed these lids into the rain barrel and distorted them. So uh, I was unable to, to put the lids on normally, but luckily uh, they had thought of that. And uh, the, uh, the tops of the lids are perforated. So you can use the tops of these lids as planters. And so we're gonna be uh, growing herbs on top of the rain barrels in these as planters. Uh, we've got a, uh, you one, one more thing, this is Laura. Yes. Um, we put a link in the chat for the free subsidized rain barrel program. So right there on the bottom of the screen there. Mm -hmm. In the chat. 
Yeah. So uh, I can't do that. One of you guys needs to do that. I did it. It's there. Excellent. So yeah, you can uh, go to this urban farm store and learn about the uh, qualifications. And, uh, and they also have these gigantic green cisterns that are like 250, 300 gallons. They're just small enough to fit through a standard doorway. Uh, but uh, those cost a couple of hundred bucks, even with the subsidy. So we went for the freebies. And I'm uh, probably going to attach some uh, drip tubing to the bottom here and go out uh, to where the mushrooms used to be because that's where my cabbage patch is going to be next. So this is where the mushrooms were until just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this bed is now expired. Uh, we've got two types of mushrooms in this bed. Uh, most of the uh, white mycelium lobes that you see here are brown oyster mushrooms, and most of the uh, chocolatey crusted ones are uh, shiitake. And uh, the way I got started with this is uh, several years ago, uh, uh, CRFG, California Rare Fruit Growers, uh, we've got a member named uh, uh, Ken Litchfield, and uh, he is the head of the San Francisco Mycological Society. And he invited us uh, CRFGers down to Far West Fungi Farms. Twice a year, they uh, used to have an open house party uh, where they would have a barbecue lunch and, uh, of mushrooms and uh, also give us tours of the grow facilities to explain how they farm the mushrooms and also uh, allow us onto the compost pile to uh, collect these loaves. These are the loaves that have already been harvested once. The uh, first flush of mushrooms gives them about a pound or two of mushrooms per loaf. And then rather than wait for them to maybe sprout a second, third, or fourth time with just two or three mushrooms a piece, they just toss these onto a compost pile and bring in fresh new loaves that they know in a X number of weeks are going to give them a big uh, financially uh, uh, viable uh, harvest and uh, they allow us hobbyists to crawl all over the compost pile and collect these, bring them home, and uh, re-sprout them. And these are good for six, seven, sometimes even eight months of uh, sporadic production. And uh, so obviously with the COVID problem, uh, they've now closed off the farm to the public uh, and uh, they no longer do the open houses, but I've got a friend uh, who does consultation for the Garones uh, that's the family that owns Far West Fungi, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, he clued me in that he was going to be collecting a truckload of these loaves, and uh, was kind enough to share 30 of them with me in exchange for a few goodies from my garden. And so now I've got a brand new uh, mushroom garden in a raised bed under the porch, and uh, it's already producing uh, several mushrooms a day for us. So next along the fence, I've got uh, some uh, English, I'm sorry, French shard. It's uh, the, uh, the boring shard, the shard with the green leaves and the, the white stems. Next year, I'm gonna plant the, uh, the rainbow shard with all the different colors. Uh, in our yard, uh, we've had a big problem with leaf miner flies. Uh, the larva that, uh, that hatch from the eggs of leaf miners will uh, make trails uh, all through the leaves and, uh, and ruin them. Uh, so I'd say I lose about half of, uh, of my edible product uh, to these leaf miners, even though I've got traps up. And the, the traps are uh, blue uh, sticky traps, not the yellow ones that you use for aphids that you find in the stores. But you need to go online and search for the, uh, the blue sticky traps. That's what the leaf miner flies are attracted to. Uh, even if you don't see any damage, I would advise you when you harvest your shard to uh, look at the uh, underside of the leaf for these little clusters of white eggs. Uh, they probably won't hurt you if you eat them, but I'm disgusted by the idea of possibly eating them. So I rub all the eggs off of any uh, shard that uh, I harvest. And uh, you can see them with the naked eye, but uh, this is a magnified uh, view of them. They're really, really tiny. Oh, let me go back to that one more, uh, one more second. You might notice uh, all these little bamboo sticks here. Uh, these are kind. These are uh, feral cat punji sticks. Uh, we've got a lot of feral cats in the neighborhood. We don't let our cats outside, but uh, we've got neighbors who allow their cats to roam, and they love to dig in the garden and pee and poop and ruin our food. 
uh, if a cat can't squat comfortably, they're not going to dig and pee and poop. So I put these bamboo skewers in uh, business side up so that uh, cats will think twice about getting in there. Avocados in San Francisco. Yes, indeed. Uh, I had my doubts personally about whether you could uh, fruit avocados, but uh, my backyard neighbor proved me wrong. He's got a Haas avocado tree that gives him fruit. So I said, what the hey? When uh, one of the big box stores had an avocado on sale, I grabbed it. Uh, and uh, sure enough, first year it flowered quite profusely. It didn't uh, set any fruit because the Haas avocado all by itself is a type A flower. And uh, there were no type B flowers in neighbor's yards nearby to cross pollinate it with. So I grafted on a scion of Ganter, which is a type B, and this year hand pollinated between the two because they flowered uh, simultaneously and I've got some avocados hanging on the tree now. So what's this type A, type B business? Uh, avocados are uh, quite uh, politically correct for the Bay Area as a fruit. Uh, they are constantly in sexual transition. The, uh, the A-type uh, flowers uh, wake up in the morning as females, and by afternoon they've transitioned to males. The Bs are just the opposite. They wake up in the morning as males, and by the late afternoon they have transitioned into being females. So the trick is to get the pollen transferred between the two at the appropriate time when you've got a male and a female of the opposite types. It's, uh, it's a little tricky, but uh, it can be done. So Bruce, yes. someone asks, where did you get the ganter? Ah, uh, I bought the Scion mail order. Uh, oh, the, the name of the, the company that I buy my uh, fruit Scions escapes me now. Uh, let's make a note that I will uh, research that, uh, get back to you, and you can post that answer up at a later date. Apricots in San Francisco, you know, the, uh, the Valley of Hearts Delight uh, down in uh, Silicon Valley uh, was... Uh, before it got built up, like the apricots growing center of the universe. And it's perfect for apricots up here in San Francisco, not so much. Uh, my apricot tree uh, is a Katy uh, with uh, several graphs of different varieties. And uh, it's never produced more than one or two apricots a year. It's just the wrong climate for it. Uh, two years ago at a, a CRFG Scion Exchange, uh, Kelly spotted this bag of Scions here. Uh, from uh, someone who lived very close by to us and uh, whose tree was dying and uh, wanted to share some cuttings of it to other folks in San Francisco in order to keep that DNA going. Uh, if, if you can read that, uh, what they've written on here, it's, uh, it's quite compelling and we couldn't resist and I grabbed a couple scions, grafted them onto our tree and now my apricot is dead. <laughs> so apparently the reason that this wonderful mission uh, apricot planted in 1917 was, uh, was in decline is that it had some kind of a virus disease. And uh, these folks uh, in their generosity unknowingly shared it with me and I no longer have a live apricot tree. That's, uh, that's the danger of grafting is you, you never know uh, if, uh, if the tree you're getting uh, a scion from was perfectly healthy. In this case, it was not. Patanga, this is a, a two-year-old seedling. Uh, once again, uh, at a CRFG uh, meeting, uh, someone uh, shared a couple of Dixie cups with little sprouted uh, Suriname cherry seeds, and I grabbed one. Uh, I grew it in a pot on the porch for uh, over a year and uh, only recently have uh, put it in the ground. Uh, it has uh, survived two winters outside, so I'm confident that uh, I'll at least get some vigorous vegetative growth. Uh, the, uh, the, the Arboretum down in, uh, down in Golden Gate Park has uh, one of these growing uh, indoors, and it fruits. Uh, I don't know how climate controlled that particular area is, so, uh, I'm just going to keep letting it grow, and in a few years we'll know if I'm going to get flowers and fruits. Uh, Suriname cherry is a, is, a, is a yummy and odd-looking little fruit. Looks like a miniature black pumpkin, uh, and uh, the flavor is kind of like uh, caramelized cherry. If you were to take a cherry and maybe uh, barbecue it for a few seconds, 
Uh, that's uh, what a, a Batanga tastes like. So I'm looking forward to having this as a new rare fruit uh, productive tree. Grapes. So most of you live in uh, areas where grapes are no big deal. Uh, but here in San Francisco, it's real tough to uh, grow grapes. I must have tried six, seven, eight different varieties of grapes, uh, and none of them did well. This Emeryville pink grape variety is a California native that was uh, discovered across the bay. And uh, uh, Annie's Annuals out uh, in Richmond, California, uh, propagates these every year. And uh, they sell maybe between 50 and 75 rooted cuttings uh, in uh, say January, February, March. So uh, if, if you're in San Francisco or one of the foggier areas of San Mateo County, I highly recommend this as a grape variety that you can grow successfully. You can see that, uh, that little uh, photograph on uh, the banister of our stairs is just loaded with grape bunches. We probably had 35 pounds of grapes on, uh, on the staircase this year and this vine is only about four or five years old. That photograph was taken after I had harvested about half of the grapes. So we got about 10, gra 10 pounds of grapes in the fridge. And the day after this photograph was taken, the raccoons discovered the grapes and completely decimated them. They had a grape eating party and uh, just cleaned me out. The masked bandits. Uh, I have no answer for raccoons. I don't know how to keep them away other than keeping like a, a pit bull dog in your backyard. But uh, even that probably uh, would not work. Raccoons are fierce and they are brave and uh, they are hungry and they love fruit. So it's a constant battle in my backyard between uh, me and the raccoons. These so are, Bruce, yes. Uh, what time of year did you say Annie's was selling the Emeryville pink grape? Uh, you, should, you should go on her website and, and search for Emeryville pink every few weeks. Uh, generally speaking, what happens is that uh, once the grapes go dormant, say November, December, people will take cuttings and start rooting them. And uh, by January, February, uh, they've uh, rooted enough and uh, started uh, breaking bud uh, such that she'll put them on sale on her website. But uh, it, it varies from year to year uh, by a couple of weeks. So I would just keep on checking. If you go to her website right now, she'll probably list Emeryville Pink and it'll just say out of stock. But by uh, December, January, February, somewhere in that time frame, you might be able to run in there and grab one. They go really fast. Once she puts them on sale, they're gone in like three or four days. Uh, I will also be sharing out some cuttings uh, probably in uh, January if you want just scions to root yourself. And uh, come springtime, I might share out a few rooted ones. I should say that these are seeded grapes, by the way. They have, they have seeds, but they're crunchy and edible. Uh, I find the crunch to be uh, satisfying and, uh, and fun, but if you feel like seedless grapes, this might not be the right uh, grape for you. Uh, next tree moving, uh, moving north is a uh, tropical guava. This is your classic tropical guava, the pink flesh with the uh, black seeds and uh, has a taste kind of like tutti frutti. Uh, it, it grows vigorously, vegetatively, it flowers, it uh, forms fruit, but unfortunately it flowers so late in the season that uh, by the time uh, our temperatures start to drop off and the, the nights start to get longer, the fruits slow down and stop growing. And uh, it, it doesn't, the, the fruit does not become full sized or fully ripened. So uh, I've, I've fallen out of love with this, with this tree. As much as I would like this tree to uh, produce wonderful fruit, it just, I just can't make it happen. So uh, I'm probably gonna replace this tree next year with a Japotecaba. I've got uh, several Japotecaba seedlings uh, up on the porch. They're tiny right now, just like two inches tall, but uh, I figure about two years from now, they should be big enough to, uh, to put out in the garden. So that's gonna be uh, where the Japotecaba live. Japotecaba is a very interesting fruit. Uh, the fruits form right on the trunk of the tree. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a weird looking, uh, looking fruit. They look like giant uh, black grapes. So I'm looking forward to that. 
So tropical guava, not for San Francisco. If you're in one of the warmer parts of San Mateo County, give it a shot. I think it might work for you. So moving on towards the middle of the east side of the fence, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go to the uh, Fijoa, which is pineapple guava. I've got a grapefruit, white sapote, my favorite fruit in the whole world. You'll see my compost bin and uh, my lettuce patch. Uh, we've also got uh, a little uh, herb patch here uh, with pineapple sage, culinary sage, purple sage, Greek oregano, which I got uh, from a generous uh, cutting from uh, our uh, colleague. Uh, in the master gardeners, catnip, lavender, lilac, rosemary, thyme, uh, lots of fun stuff that Kelly uses culinarily. Fijoa, which is also known as pineapple guava, uh, is a beautiful bushy uh, shrub. Uh, the flower petals, the four uh, pink and white flower petals are, are edible. Uh, it's one of the edible flowers that you can sprinkle on top of a salad they're very, very sweet and perfumey. It's, uh, it's quite unique. Uh, the, um, I've had this tree for maybe eight years or so, and uh, I've never gotten fruit from it. It flowers, but it has not set fruit. And I'm not sure why, because I've got some neighbors who do get fruit from their uh, pineapple guava. And uh, those fruits are delicious and they're big. They're, uh, it's kind of a grainy fruit, like a very grainy pear with a very tropical flavor that uh, I'm not sure how to uh, describe it. It's kind of like um, a little bit like a grape, a little bit like a pear. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an unusual tropical flavor. If you haven't had one, you should seek them out. They're ripe around this time of year and uh, you don't pick them, you wait for them to fall to the ground. And uh, they're about the size of, uh, of a small pear. Rio Red Grapefruit. My tree is just loaded with fruit right now. And it, uh, the flowers are extremely fragrant. Uh, the vegetative growth is vigorous. Uh, but for San Francisco, Rio Red Grapefruit is, is kind of a marginal fruit. If you don't mind putting uh, sugar on your, uh, on your grapefruit, then I would say go ahead and grow this. But you know, if, you're, if you're trying to stay away from sugar, uh, unless you like your grapefruit super, super sour and tart, might not be a good idea to grow this one. You might want to go with uh, maybe a pumelo if you want something uh, grapefruity, because uh, uh, this one never gets super, super sweet. And I'd say about half of the grapefruits on this tree, because we don't get enough summer heat, uh, about half of the fruit that we get off this tree uh, don't have very much edible in them. They, they're very, very fibrous. So only about half of the fruit uh, are like uh, good grapefruits. And they also, because they don't, uh, they don't get the summer heat, we don't get the deep red color that is uh, typical of the Rio red grapefruit. It's more like a, a pink grapefruit, more like a, a ruby red. White sapote. So I'm a little crazy about white sapote. Um, like I've become like the uh, the Johnny Appleseed of white sapote. I think it's the most the world's most delicious fruit. Uh, there's a there's a guy over in the East Bay who's a member of CRFG who's even nuttier than I am about this. His name is Tom Addison, and uh, he grows he grows dozens of white sapote trees and uh, tries to supply people with uh, seeds and fruit and cuttings. The uh, the flavor of a white sapote is like creme brulee. It's like, uh, it's like flan growing on a tree. The, uh, the, uh, the flesh is a, a, a creamy, uh, soft, uh, delicious, spoonable treat uh, that uh, does not ship well because uh, these, most of these uh, fruits do not ripen off the tree. So you have to wait till they're, they're ripe to pick them. And because of that, it'd be very, very difficult to uh, be successful commercially. So you never see these in your supermarket, but uh, in, uh, in Central and South America, uh, these are very popular fruits uh, in uh, the local fruit stands where you've got much more farm to table uh, direct culture. Uh, 
beware that the seeds of white sapotes are poisonous. Poisonous might be an overstatement. Uh, uh, let's just say that they, most of the, the medical literature uh, says that they have a soporific effect. So they're kind of like sleeping pills. And yeah, you could overdose on them and kill yourself, but, uh, or maybe even trip. Just don't eat the seeds, bad idea. Uh, the, the grafted seedlings are, are quite precocious. Uh, if, you, if you just grow a tree from seed, it might take seven or eight years to produce fruit. And uh, you might not necessarily get fruit as good as the parent was. So my recommendation is to uh, grow your seedling to about uh, two or three years old and then graft a known good variety onto it. And uh, that should produce fruit within two or three years. You'll get uh, heavy crops and early crops. I have multiple varieties grafted onto this one tree. Uh, I've got, uh, what you're looking at there is Vernon, which uh, I think is the most precocious and uh, the uh, sweetest variety. I've also got uh, Kate, Malibu 3, uh, Chestnut, and Walton grafted onto this tree. So we used to have one of these uh, black, little black 55 gallon compost bins that we got for free from the city like 25, 30 years ago. And that started to deteriorate and voles tunneled into it, ate all our worms, and uh, we had to replace it. So once again, the world's worst uh, stone and uh, brick mason went to work to create a little platform underneath this. So to prevent the, uh, the mice and the rats and the voles from tunneling in. We've got uh, some good mesh underneath it to uh, doubly protect against it. And uh, we scoured Amazon.com for the, uh, the biggest compost bin that we could find. And we found this jewel 187 gallon uh, monster. It's like four feet tall. It's, uh, it's gonna take us months and months and months to fill it up with kitchen scraps. And, um, but I've already transplanted a bunch of worms in here. Anytime I find uh, a nice earthworm in the garden, I'll toss it into the bin, give them a new home. And uh, maybe in a year or two, I'll be able to start harvesting compost again. Uh, Bruce? Yes. There's a question on the chat about your sapote. Yes. I'm wondering to know how big the tree is. I prune all of my fruit trees uh, to be no taller than around eight feet. Uh, this white sapote right now is in need of a pruning and is probably around 10 feet tall. Uh, the trick with white sapote is, is that the, uh, it's, there's, an, there's an apical dominance thing going on with white sapote. Uh, all these sprouts after you prune want to be leaders, but when the leaders get to be about three feet long, they start bending over and drooping you know, in a, like a weeping willow fashion. And it's the, once the, once a shoot begins to weep and droop below the, uh, the apical dominance of the true leaders on the tree, those become giant fruit spurs. And so you want to encourage your white sapote tree to droop. You can, you can attach weights to the tip of, uh, of the uh, growing leaders to make them bend down and uh, you wanna create a tree that's got lots of weeping branches and that's how you get a lot of fruit. But uh, because I hate ladders, because I've, I've had ladder accidents uh, in my uh, young past, uh, I do not want to have to use a ladder to climb to the top of a large tree to prune it or to pick fruit. So I keep all my fruit trees pruned down to uh, where I can reach with my tippy toes, which is about eight feet tall. So next to the compost bin, I've got uh, my lettuce patch. All this lettuce has actually been uh, uh, harvested and I've got uh, 50 new lettuce seedlings out there right now. I like to buy my lettuce seeds from Johnny's. Uh, they've got some, uh, some really nice varieties that are pelleted, which uh, helps to give you almost 100% uh, germination success. And uh, some of their, uh, their newer varieties like the Salanova, are, uh, are really yummy. Uh, these are, uh, this is a mescaline mix from Renee's, uh, which was also a very nice uh, mix of, of lettuce. I start them indoors in those little uh, one inch uh, 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 
bins. I've got these little uh, these little planters that have like 50 or 100 little one inch cubes and uh, takes about three weeks to get them up to uh, to two sets of true leaves and then I'll set them out. Um, like I said, 40 or 50 plants will uh, keep us in salad for several months. And uh, here in San Francisco, we just grow them all year long. You know, it's, you don't have to worry about it being spring or fall or winter or summer. This lettuce just grows all year long in, in uh, San Francisco. In the sunnier parts of San Mateo, you might be limited to maybe, you know, three quarters of a year uh, for some forms of uh, lettuce. But for us, lettuce just grows all the time. That, uh, that little herb garden that, uh, that I showed you on the schematic is, uh, is on the left as we uh, continue to walk north in the garden. Uh, this uh, photograph is of catnip, uh, which I grow for the kitties. Uh, sometimes I'll rub a cat toy onto the, uh, the fresh leaves and the, uh, especially the uh, flower stalks. It's got the, the most uh, terpenes and uh, drives the cats crazy, makes them happy. And uh, Kelly also uh, harvests, uh, for uh, culinary reasons, uh, various herbs almost every day. So we, we uh, cook with fresh herbs all the time. Oh, and the, uh, in the rain barrel planter lids that I showed you before, we've got uh, cinnamon basil, lemon balm, coriander, and parsley. Uh, two varieties in each of those lids. Uh, all of these are... Uh, are basically growing perennially for us except for the basil. I just can't seem to keep basil alive here in San Francisco and I've tried five or six different varieties. So basil I just have to keep on replanting. So next part of the schematic is going to show us the uh, northern end of the east fence we've got right here. So next, we're going to be looking at uh, my tomato patch, the cucumbers, peppers, tomatillos. I've got another tropical fruit tree, a jujube or jujube. We've got our artichokes over on the uh, other side of the path. I've got a persimmon tree, apple. You'll see a, a little dragon fruit seedling and my Romano beans. So this variety of persimmon is called izu. And it is a non-astringent variety, meaning that as soon as the, uh, the fruits color up, even though they are not soft, but still crunchy, they are sweet enough to eat and won't uh, pucker you up. So this is a special photograph I took with a uh, 3D camera. And uh, I have put this up on the screen for your amusement. Uh, this, is a, this is a trick that we use in 3D photography called free viewing. And uh, the left image is on the right, and the right image is on the left. So in order to see this in three dimensions, what you have to do is look at the screen so that it fills most of your field of view, relax your eyes, and cross your eyes. When you cross your eyes, you should see magically floating in the middle a third image of the 3D fruits breaking through the window of your, uh, your video screen and hanging right in front of you. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes to kind of relax, meditate on this, cross your eyes gently, don't try to force it, just kind of relax your eyes and cross them. Keep your eyes wide open while you're crossing them and you should see these, this branch with the uh, persimmons floating right in front of your nose. You're going to want to just put your hand out and try to grab it. You seeing any reaction in the chat or people actually uh, experiencing this or are they saying I'm nuts? No reaction in the chat. Everybody's too impressed. <laughs> Leave this up for a few more seconds for people to play with. Oh, somebody says here that it works. Several All right. people say it works. Right. As, long as, as, long as, we got, as long as we got one person who says it worked for them, now I've taught you something new. We're going to move on. Oh, here's a question about basil. Okay. Move on. It says, have you tried African basil? Yes, African blue basil. I love mm -hmm. African blue basil. I know a lot of people aren't crazy about the flavor. Uh, it's a beautiful plant. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I have grown African blue basil successfully during the warmer 
uh, months, but it dies in the winter. And of course, African blue basil is sterile. You can only grow it from cuttings. All those flowers it produces are mules. They have no seeds. So um, yeah, uh, doesn't work for me. Doesn't overwinter. So next is the tomato patch. This is the, uh, the largest planting of veggies that I have. Uh, many of you know that uh, I've developed my own uh, San Francisco Sunrise variety of tomatoes. Uh, right now, the tomatoes have all been removed and I'm now growing fava beans in this area. But uh, up until last week, we were still picking tomatoes. So the story of San Francisco Sunrise is that uh, you know, here in, uh, here in the uh, fog transition zone, I was never able to grow large beefsteak style tomatoes. And every year I would try another variety, sometimes five or six varieties at once. Cherry tomatoes, no problem. Pear tomatoes, no problem. We always got plentiful harvests of those little tomatoes, but the big tomatoes just never ripened for us. I found a, a variety of tomato uh, called Orange Jazz and it was sold online by a company called Totally Tomatoes. Uh, and Orange Jazz was giving us nice little six to eight ounce beautiful orange tomatoes. Uh, and one branch apparently uh, uh, produced a, a bud sport mutation spontaneously. And the tomatoes on that branch were weirdly different. They had, they were deeply cleft with lobes like pumpkins, and they were beautifully striped with this red etching over the, uh, the orange flesh. And that red etching uh, carries through into the inside, uh, the cross section. When you cut the, uh, the tomato open, it's, uh, it's got this network of red veins. And uh, I posted a picture of it on Google+, Plus, which was my uh, social media network at the time. And people started asking me for seeds. And quite frankly, I had no idea even how to save tomato seeds. And it never occurred to me to, uh, to save the seeds from this, to maybe preserve this tomato as a line. And uh, my friends on Google+, Plus convinced me to give it a try. So I had to do some research. And I had to go online and uh, learn how to save tomato seeds. Uh, you have to ferment them uh, because the, uh, the seeds, as you can uh, remember from thinking about cutting open a tomato, are, are surrounded by this gelatinous uh, liquid. And uh, that gelatin has a germination inhibitor hormone in it. So you have to remove that gel. The way you remove that gel is you ferment them for a few days and uh, then you wash away the uh, remains and then dry the seeds. And uh, I now sell these seeds on eBay uh, and uh, I've been doing this for four or five years. Uh, I've been donating the seeds to our spring garden market so that we can sell these. And uh, I've also donated uh, to our most recent graduates a packet of seeds to all the new master gardeners. I hope you've all had success with that. And the uh, San Francisco Department of Parks and Recreation has been buying seeds from me and plants from the master gardener spring garden markets and they distribute them out to uh, all their community gardens throughout San Francisco. Uh, this is a great tomato for the fog. I've had tomatoes in the one pound range. I've had people in warmer areas of, uh, of the Bay and in warmer areas of the country uh, show me uh, tomatoes that they've grown that came close to two pounds. Just uh, it's amazing to me. And uh, I will, this year I had kind of a, a meager harvest. I only grew 24 plants this year and uh, I didn't have any super sized ones because we had some really weird weather. The, uh, the super heat wave that we had scorched my tomatoes and uh, stunted their growth. But uh, I believe I have enough seeds to uh, continue the line and continue improving it and selecting the genetics to, uh, to keep this going. So uh, I'll Listen. have the, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm just going to say that in a few days I'll be uh, changing uh, that packed fresh for 2020 to packed fresh for 2021 and I'll have uh, seeds on eBay available for sale and once again once we figure out what we're going to do with our spring garden market I will of course be donating these seeds again so that we can uh, sell them during our sale. What was the question? Oh, it wasn't actually a question just so you know there's several comments on the chat from people who grew these this year and love 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 them. So Cool. 
Yes. Very happy to hear that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm never going to make any money on this. I'll take, uh, I'll take limited local fame over fortune. I'm glad to be able to share this with uh, my fellow frustrated fog tomato gardeners. So that's my gal Kelly, and she's uh, holding one of the 27 varieties of apples that I've grafted onto our one little tree. Uh, that variety is called grenadine, and you'll notice that uh, it's very deeply pink fleshed on the inside. This is one of the Etter ap apples, uh, a fellow named Albert Etter up in uh, Northern California, devoted his uh, horticultural life to developing a line of uh, of red fleshed apples. There's maybe a dozen different red fleshed apples attributed to his genetics. Uh, most of the uh, apples on uh, my tree get bagged with these uh, red wax uh, Japanese apple growing bags. This protects them from uh, the moths. It uh, confuses the birds. The birds can still get through them if they really want to. Uh, I find that, uh, that some bugs figure out how to get into the bag no matter how tightly I wrap it. But uh, for the most part, this helps me uh, have uh, a much higher percentage of usable, eatable apples. Uh, without the bags, I probably lose half of the apples to uh, birds, uh, vertebrate pests, uh, disease. The, uh, the apple bags have a little bit of, uh, of fungicide on them as well. Uh, I bought these uh, directly from the manufacturer in Japan. Uh, I, I basically bought myself a lifetime supply of these. The smallest amount that they would be willing to sell was a box of uh, 5,000 bags. And uh, in, in, in all the, I probably only use about 200 a year. So uh, I think uh, I'll have to uh, will the uh, remainder to, uh, to someone when I pass because I'm never going to use up all these bags. Well, I've also got, you can't see it in the picture, I've got a, a pheromone lure trap. Uh, one of those Monterey uh, coddling moth traps in the tree to try to uh, keep the moths from uh, laying their eggs on the apples. Uh, I've got mixed feelings about that. I worry that the uh, that the uh, sticky trap lure with the pheromones uh, might attract more moths than I would normally get in the first place. So I'm not I'm not convinced that the the moth traps are a great idea, but I do it. Cucumbers along the fence. I've got, uh, I had some trellised cucumbers, which, uh, you know, that season is now done. I'm not sure what I'm going to plant in that area next. Uh, I'm thinking maybe broccoli will be the next thing that I plant there. I know most people plant their cucumbers and let the, the vines trail on the ground. And uh, the problem with that is that, uh, you know, the cucumbers can get curled if they, if they uh, run into an obstacle. Uh, and uh, I find that by trellising my cucumbers and letting the fruits hang, you get a nice straight cucumber. And uh, just six plants are all we need uh, to keep us in salads all summer long. Uh, can't tell you the variety of this one. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> it was uh, just something right off the shelf from a big box store, you know. I just, uh, just uh, walked in on impulse, saw a package of cucumber seeds and grabbed it. There is an apple question. One yes. Um, just wants to know if you have any mutsu, mutsu apples? Yes, mutsu is one of my oldest grafts. In fact, uh, I brought that graft of mutsu up from uh, Southern California when I was uh, first dating Kelly like 17, 18 years ago. Uh, I had a house in Southern California in Val Verde and I had a multi-grafted apple tree. And uh, this, the apple tree is one of the first trees that we planted in Kelly's yard. And the mutsu was one of the very first grafts that I put on that. Uh, mutsu is a great apple. It's a huge green apple that in a long enough season will turn yellow, but uh, I pick, they come off the tree mostly green for us. They're gigantic fruits, the biggest apple on the tree. They're great for, uh, for applesauce. Uh, yeah, it's a fine apple and it's a low chill apple. So it's great for this area. Uh, so next, moving down towards the corner, are my, are my peppers. These peppers are Rokoto peppers, the, uh, the yellow ones in the large picture and the, uh, the red ones in the basket in the smaller picture. Uh, 
Rakoto peppers are native to the, um, the mountains of Peru, uh, where they, uh, they grow as perennial understory trees, as do all chili peppers in their natural habitats. The, uh, the unusual aspect of the Rakotos is that uh, they are not uh, capsations, but rather pubescence. And uh, the, the pubescence all have fuzzy leaves instead of smooth leaves and black seeds instead of uh, white or beige colored seeds. These are very hot peppers. Uh, the yellows are a little bit more flavorful, a little bit more fruity, uh, but both have some chlorophyll-y, grassy undertones and uh, are really best if uh, stuffed with, uh, with a very flavorful uh, either vegetable or or grain and meat mix. It's the national dish of Peru. And uh, this particular, uh, the red one that I have is about 15 years old. It has survived many frosts. The yellow that you're seeing in that photo is about six years old. I find that anytime we get a hard freeze, my yellow ricottos will die back. They're a little bit more frost sensitive than uh, the red ricottos. But uh, if you're looking for a tree full of hot chili peppers, ricotto is the way to go. I keep this pruned to about eight feet tall. Uh, every January, I'll prune it down to about uh, the six foot level, the top of the, uh, the green posts, and then it'll grow another two or three feet during the year and I'll, I'll hack it back down. It would probably grow to 12, 15, 20 feet if I let it. It's, uh, as you can see, it's uh, very prolific and fruitful. I've also got uh, Aleppo peppers. Uh, they are uh, kind of a cay uh, cayenne type pepper that's native to Aleppo, Syria. It's a favorite of chefs and they're in very, very short supply right now because of the Syrian civil war that's been going on for several years. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, the geography of, uh, of Syria, uh, Aleppo is up in that uh, northernmost uh, uh, western tier near Turkey where a, a lot of the heaviest fighting has taken place and it's wiped out the farms where the, uh, the Aleppo peppers uh, are normally grown. I was able to get some seeds from a, a little company called Artisan, Artisan Seeds up in uh, Sonoma County. Uh, and I believe that Artisan Seeds, which is owned by a fellow named uh, uh, Hempel, Frank Hempel, uh, is the developer of Orange Jazz, the, uh, the origin, the great, great grandfather of San Francisco Sunrise. I also purchased from, uh, from him uh, some uh, giant yellow ahi peppers, which are not pictured here. Uh, that one is, uh, is kind of a sweet, hot yellow pepper. Uh, I find that here in San Francisco, they do not become giant sized. Uh, they were advertised as, as being six to eight inches long and mine are ripening up after being only about half that size. And that's probably because of the, uh, the cool foggy weather here. But uh, both peppers uh, are growing really nicely and uh, I'm hoping that they will overwinter. We'll see. Artichokes, uh, you know, in many parts of the country, artichokes are grown as annuals. But uh, here in the, uh, on the West Coast, we can grow our artichokes as biennial or even perennials. Uh, they, uh, they spread like irises. So every three or four years, you need to uh, dig up the tubers and separate them just like you would irises. We've got two varieties. We've got green globe and also violetta. Uh, the violetta are very, very thorny, but uh, you know they're worth it. These, they're, they're very small, but they're very succulent and tasty. Purple tomatillos, uh, these things grow like weeds. Uh, I direct seed them. It's one of the very, very few veggies where I will plant the seeds directly in the soil. Uh, the reason being that the, the seedlings are very, very fragile. And every time I've tried to transplant them, I've broken like a third of them. They just, they just snap. So rather than deal with that, I'll just, I'll just dig a furrow and I'll sprinkle seeds let them all come up and then I thin them down so that uh, they form a, a thicket, a row. Uh, down in Mexico, uh, they don't even really uh, grow these on purpose. They just, they just let them grow like weeds amongst uh, the cornfields. 
uh, they just they just they self seed really easily. Any anywhere that I have planted tomatillos, I get volunteers for years and years after because there's always a fruit or two that falls that you miss, gets buried in the in the humus, and boom, next season those seeds just sprout like crazy. So once you start growing tomatillos, you will always have them. I got and I got these seeds from uh, Johnny's. Johnny's is one of my favorite seed sources. Jujubes or jujubes. Uh, these are very popular in China. In China, they've got maybe three or four hundred different varieties of jujube. Here in the United States, there are probably only about a dozen varieties available. Uh, in Southern California, I had a, a large uh, Lee variety tree that would uh, produce hundreds of pounds of fruit a year. Here in San Francisco, it's pretty marginal. Uh, the tree grows very slowly in San Francisco and uh, the fruit ripens very late in the season. I'm just getting ripe fruit off it now and uh, only a handful. You know, if I get a dozen fruit off of my tree, uh, I'll be lucky. Uh, I've got Shanxi Li, uh, a, uh, an experimental variety out of uh, the breeding program from uh, California called GA-866 and a variety called Honey Jar. The little bitty ones there are Honey Jar and uh, the larger one there is a uh, Shanxi Li. Uh, they, uh, they taste like apples, uh, very, very sweet apples with a little bit of caramel undertone. When you eat them fresh like this, uh, mostly brown with maybe a little bit of yellow and green on them. Uh, you can also allow them to dry either on the tree or uh, inside uh, in a dryer. And uh, then they become like, uh, like dates. Uh, in fact, uh, some stores will sell these under the name Chinese dates or red dates. We've got uh, Romano beans along the back fence, trained to bamboo poles. Uh, we find they uh, grow really, really nicely here in San Francisco. I put about uh, five seeds, seedlings around each pole and let them just vine right up. Uh, I need to pick these uh, every three or four days where they uh, get out of control. And uh, I'm actually still picking Romano beans now. Uh, I'll probably uh, pull these out and replace them with uh, snow peas in just uh, another week or two. Next to that in the back are our summer squash. Uh, everybody knows that uh, you know, zucchinis can get out of control. Once again, you can see the uh, stockade of uh, business end up uh, anti-cat punji sticks uh, where I've got the, uh, the seedlings of the summer squash. This is another crop that I will direct seed. Uh, I just find that uh, summer squash grows more vigorously if you allow uh, the roots to be undisturbed. So I'll just uh, I'll, I'll plant them directly but protect them with the bamboo poles because uh, seedlings of summer squash uh, are a favorite food of some of the local birds and rodents. Yellow dragon fruit. Uh, dragon fruit here in San Francisco and probably down on the peninsula as well will grow vigorously, vegetatively, but not flower and not fruit. Uh, this particular yellow variety was supposed to be a little bit more cold tolerant and indeed it, it does overwinter, but it never flowers for me. Uh, I've also had sabra, which is a more traditional dragon fruit with a red flesh that uh, grew very vigorously, but never flowered. I gave cuttings of it to uh, Kelly's cousins in uh, Walnut Creek and it flowers. Uh, it did not fruit probably because it did not have a, a companion for cross-pollination. But if you live someplace that gets uh, you know, hot summers like Walnut Creek does, then you can go ahead and try dragon fruit. But uh, for San Francisco and the peninsula as well, uh, I cannot endorse trying to grow dragon fruit. I've got a little baby macadamia tree. Uh, I obtained this from a uh, California Rare Fruit Growers Annual Convention about uh, four years ago as a seedling and uh, grew it on the porch for two or three years, have now planted it in the backyard and have my fingers crossed. Uh, I don't know anybody uh, in San Francisco who is uh, growing macadamia. 
Uh, but I do know that over across the Bay in Berkeley, there are several macadamia trees on the University of Berkeley campus that uh, grow vigorously, flower and fruit. So, hey, who knows, maybe. We'll see what happens in a few years. I think it's worth a try. Macadamias are wonderful. Next to that is my loquat patch. I've got three loquats planted in one hole. Uh, this might be uh, amongst the non-Asian population in San Francisco, our best kept fruit secret. All of my Asian neighbors have loquat trees. It's part of the culture uh, and it's a, a cherished fruit. Uh, loquats come true to the parent. These are not named varieties. What I, the way I got my loquat trees is I went to a, a, a loquat tree, a loquat tasting over in the East Bay about 10 years ago, uh, where uh, one of our members collected fruit from trees th that were overhanging into the public space. And he collected the biggest and yummiest looking fruits and we had a tasting and uh, I saved the seeds from the three favorite fruits that I tasted that day, sprouted them, grew them in a pot for about three years and then put them in the backyard. And I get tremendous harvests of fruit from these three trees. Big, yummy, juicy, wonderful fruit. Uh, I know a lot of folks, you know, complain that the that juju that uh, loquat trees are messy or or they make uh, crappy fruit. Uh, it's I urge you to uh, find either a good named variety juju uh, loquat or uh, or or get seeds from someone who is growing good fruit. It's probably the easiest tree to have successful fruit production from uh, it, that you can grow in the Bay Area. The, the flavor, if you've never had one, is kind of a, a mashup of mango, apricot, and orange. You can eat the peel, or most of my little old lady neighbors, what they'll do is they will, they will peel it. Uh, the peel comes off really easily, and uh, you just eat around the seeds. There are usually uh, several really large seeds uh, in a loquat. Uh, it flowers in the wintertime, uh, probably uh, in December, January is when you're going to see most of your flower production uh, with loquats. And uh, that brings up the question of pollination. Most of the bees, or at least the European honeybees, are uh, staying close to home during the winter. There are a few native bumblebees that will uh, explore during the winter, but for the most part, I find I need to hand pollinate my loquats. So every two or three days, I'll go out, collect pollen on a uh, little artist brush and transfer it between the, the clusters of fruit. And uh, I get great yields by uh, enhancing pollination manually. And uh, you know, I highly recommend experimenting with this. It's, it's great fun. Well, you have a cherry tree and it's multi-grafted. There are several different varieties on it. Now, the books are all tell you that, uh, that cherry trees need huge numbers of chill hours, 800, 1,000, 1,200 hours of chill in order to make fruit. And that might be true for the commercial varieties that, uh, that you find in the store like Bing. Uh, and it might be a good guideline for commercial growers to maximize their yields. But the myth of chill hours is that people think of chill hours as being a, a hard cutoff rule. And it's really more of a gray scale. Uh, even cherries that have high chill hours will produce in areas like San Francisco with very, very few chill hours, they just won't produce as heavily. So if you don't mind just getting a few cherries instead of bucketfuls of cherries, you can plant almost any variety you want. Now the base uh, tree on, on our plant is a Stella. And Stella is, no, is low chill. And I've got graphs of several other varieties, Lapins, Van, Black Republican, Rainier, Early Purple Guillaume. And uh, I get cherries from all those varieties. Not a huge amount, but I get cherries. Now I have to net the tree to actually eat those cherries because if I don't put a net on that tree, the birds will get them all. Birds love cherries even more than I do. And they 
tend to pick their cherries before they reach the peak ripeness that we humans like. So don't wait until the cherries turn red to net your tree because the birds will get them before you even net them. You wanna net your tree uh, once the, uh, the fruits are full sized, but still green. If you try to net your tree during flowering or uh, when the, the fruits are really small, you might knock some off. So I like to wait until they are mature sized, but not ripe yet. And then I'll put the net on the tree and hopefully I'll be able to get some harvest before the birds do. Plum, uh, another really easy to grow fruit tree for San Francisco. Uh, my fruit tree is all Asian varieties. Uh, you don't want to uh, graft uh, a mix of Asian and European varieties on the same tree because they are graft incompatible. If you've got a European tree, you only want to use European style cuttings. If you've got an Asian tree, you only want to use Asian style cuttings. And most of the, uh, the, the uh, grafts on my tree are uh, from, from varieties developed by Luther Burbank. Uh, the base tree is Beauty, which is a large, very, very juicy plum. Not the best for eating out of hand, but it's great for making uh, jams and jellies and juices. Um, and I've also uh, got several other varieties grafted onto it. Uh, Methylee, Pedro, Shiro, Inca, Golden Nectar, Mariposa, and a few others. Uh, we made the mistake of accidentally ordering a standard tree. So it's got a huge trunk to it, and it's a lot of work for me to, uh, to keep it pruned down to my usual eight, nine, 10 foot height. Uh, if you wanna keep your fruit trees pruned low, like I do, make sure you get semi-dwarf trees. Don't get full dwarf, or you'll die of old age before you get fruit and before it grows more than two or three feet tall. The, the, the full dwarfs are just too tiny to be of any use, I think. Semi-dwarfs are the way to go. Uh, where did we get this tree? Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a nursery down in Atascadero called uh, Bay Laurel Nursery that, uh, that I find to be a very reliable source of bare root fruit trees. That's where we got this plum. Uh, favorite plum varieties? Uh, golden nectar is, is kind of shaped like a mango and has flavor that's a little reminiscent of mango. That's a really good one. Uh, elephant heart, a wonderful, wonderful plum. And uh, uh, burgundy is another really great plum. Deep red flesh, really sweet with, uh, with a tart skin as a counterbalance. Figs are a little dicey in San Francisco. Uh, most of the varieties that I've tried to grow, which include uh, black turkey, uh, uh, I'm sorry, brown turkey, uh, black mission, black jack, uh, a couple others, they just didn't ripen. You know, they grew the fruit and it just never got ripe. Uh, the first one I have found uh, in my explorations that uh, gives me ripe fruit is a variety called Violetta de Bordeaux. Uh, the, the fruits are kind of small. They're about half the size of, say, a mission fig, but they're really, really yummy. have a deep red flesh, and uh, I actually get to eat one or two of these before the squirrels get to them. We've got a nice little strawberry patch with multiple varieties. Uh, I prefer the day neutral types. Uh, I get... Uh, I get most of my uh, strawberry starts from uh, uh, a place up in Grass Valley. Uh, their website is uh, groworganic.com. Uh, Peaceful Valley, Peaceful Valley Farm, I think is what they're called. Uh, they've got really good prices on, uh, on their bundles of uh, 25 uh, dormant strawberry plants uh, during the winter. Uh, they've got really high shipping charges though, so you need to put in a, a big order and make it worth your while. Uh, I've also uh, started some strawberries from seed. Uh, I like to harvest just a few strawberries every day all season long. That's why I like the day neutral. Uh, but some people like the spring or the, the summer varieties, so they get a great big bucket of, uh, of strawberries all at once. Mm -hmm. 
so you have a comment that um santa clara you know that's that excelled as well in san francisco have you ever heard of those what was that variety again excel excel -E yeah i've never heard of that variety but i will uh, look for it um leeks kelly loves cooking with leeks i grow them for her uh, but I've never had a lot of success in, in getting your classic leek. You know, a leek is kind of a biannual. Uh, that takes, uh, you know, two seasons to get the leek to full size. But uh, all my leeks, no matter what variety I grow, uh, tend to form little onion type bulbs. They don't get that big leek formation. And, you know, I've tried doing the thing where you, you furrow them, you know, try to, to uh, have the most uh, blanched. Uh, part of the fleshy uh, lower part of the plant. Uh, you know, the, the harvests we get are yummy. You know, it's leek flavor, but for some reason I don't get, uh, I don't get the right form. I don't know if it's the microclimate or I'm doing something wrong with my soil chemistry, but uh, yeah, I've looked online to try to find an answer. I haven't had one yet. I've got any leek experts out there? Tell me why I'm not getting a good big leek bulbs instead of uh, these tiny little onion-like bulbs that I get. Yes, I know those, those are all way too close together. Uh, these are direct seeded and uh, they haven't been thinned yet. So don't panic when you're looking at this photo saying, oh my God, Bruce, you're doing it all wrong. You're growing a lawn of leeks. You need to give them some room. Uh, yeah, I know. I just haven't thinned those. So back to the schematic. Uh, we're gonna we're just moving back towards the house. We're uh, we're moving south now, and uh, we're gonna be looking at uh, my pear tree. I've got uh, a finger lime tree. I've got Cape gooseberries, red raspberries, gold raspberries, blackberries, uh, and a lemon tree. And when we get to that lemon tree, I'll address uh, your comment. So I grow my. Uh, my lemon tree kind of two-dimensionally. I grow it uh, espalier style. And uh, there's an interesting story behind why the French began growing their trees this way, like, like vines against walls and fences. Uh, back during the mini ice ages of uh, the Middle Ages, uh, all their fruit trees were dying off because the winters were so cold. And they came up with the idea of uh, building these uh, stone walls filled with earth to retain heat from the sun during the day, which would then reflect back onto the tree and also radiate out at night to keep the trees alive during these unusually cold winters. And they would prune their trees to hug those walls. And that's how the espalier started. And a, um, a side benefit of uh, growing all these walled orchards was that it was a great uh, military defense mechanism against uh, invading hordes. You can imagine the uh, steeplechase that uh, that invaders had to go through in uh, in a heavily walled area. Uh, we've got uh, multiple grafts on uh, on our pear tree. Every level of the ladder is a different variety. the uh, The base of the uh, tree is which is the the base is hood. The base is hood, and I've got uh, uh, lots of different varieties on here. Uh, including uh, Florida Home, Warren, Monterey, Red Clap, Seckle, Comis, Conference, and uh, quite a few others. Uh, we just uh, harvested our last pear uh, last week, and uh, that was, uh, I forget the name, uh, it was a, a big French variety. It was a, I've got a picture of it up on my Instagram account. Australian finger lime, another well-kept secret. These things will grow anywhere that lemon trees will grow. And uh, I found this Australian finger lime at uh, Four Winds Nursery during a, a CRFG tour of their facility. Uh, and it was the first year that they were releasing these for sale. It was like 10 or 12 years ago. And they had like five little one-year-old seedling grafted trees out there 
and I found one of those trees actually was uh, so precocious that it had fruit and flowers on it. And I grabbed it and I said, I'm buying this one and uh, stuck it in the yard. And uh, it's been uh, very successful. It's, uh, it's not a named variety. It's just uh, a wild uh, bush tree from Australia. And uh, gives me these wonderful luscious fruits. The, uh, the, uh, the citrus caviar that it produces ranges in color from uh, from gold to pink, sometimes kind of a light green. Uh, they're, they're like citrus pop rocks. Uh, some people call them citrus pearls. Uh, they're very popular in, in Thai style cooking. And uh, there are several chefs here in the Bay Area that, uh, that buy them from me. Uh, my tree produces 25, 30 pounds a year. And I sell them at uh, below market prices to several uh, top chefs here in the uh, in the bay area so bruce here's a uh, pear question sure um someone wants to know how do you chill your pears to ripen them well i find the only variety of pear that i grow which requires that kind of bledding or chilling is the comice and uh, what i did was i picked i only had uh two comice pears on uh, my graft this year. I picked them off the tree uh, about three weeks ago and put them into the, uh, the vegetable crisper bin of, uh, of uh, our refrigerator. And I'm gonna keep them in that bin for about two months. Once they've been in the bin for about two months in the refrigerator, I'm gonna take them out, put them on, uh, on the kitchen table and uh, they should ripen in two or three weeks. Uh, most pears, you want to pick them uh, mature, colored, but not soft. If you, if you wait for pears to ripen on the tree, when you cut them open, you'll find that the middle of the pear is rotten and there's almost nothing available to eat. Uh, pears must be picked before they're fully ripe and uh, then you uh, let them ripen off the tree and they will ripen uniformly for you. So you wanna go for color. And also for some varieties of pears, you wanna pay attention to the aroma. Monterey pears in particular uh, uh, develop uh, an intoxicating aroma when they've reached maturity. And that's when you wanna take them off the tree and let them ripen for a few more days indoors. Uh, this is my Physalis peruviana, uh, Cape gooseberry. Uh, sometimes uh, they're called uh, ground cherries by some folks. Uh, we find that uh, from seed, these will live between five and seven years in San Francisco. This is about the third planting I've gone through since I moved up here. Uh, they are incredibly prolific once they start producing. Uh, we just get buckets and buckets of fruit from these. Uh, they have a vaguely tomato undertone to them, uh, but uh, they're mostly kind of a unique sweet tart flavor. Uh, Kelly makes jams from these. Uh, we cut them up and use them in salads. Uh, they're a favorite of the grandkids. They love to uh, pop open the, uh, the little shells to reveal the yellow fruits on the inside. Uh, I generally do not pick these off of the vines themselves, but wait for them to fall fully ripened on the ground. Uh, they're also a, a favorite of the squirrels. So I'm in constant competition with the squirrels for these, but it's so prolific that uh, I can share them with the squirrels and, uh, and still have plenty. Blueberry, sunshine blue which is a southern high bush type of blueberry, uh, requires that you acidify the soil in order to have high yields. Uh, most of California has neutral to alkaline soil. So if you're gonna plant blueberries, uh, you, you do need to prepare the bed uh, by mixing in pine needles, Canadian sphagnum peat moss, uh, or, and uh, you know, fertilize them with, uh, with acid-loving plant formula. Like uh, if you go to the big box stores, you might find uh, some uh, 
plant food that's especially formulated for azaleas. That's another acid loving plant uh, that would work just fine for blueberries. Uh, some people uh, seem to feel that you need to uh, prune blueberries quite severely early in their life in order to get good fruit later. Uh, I dispute that. Uh, the only pruning I do is around the skirt of the bush and uh, I've just let it go absolutely hog wild in, the, uh, in that little area that you see I've got planted there. Uh, you can see that uh, that blueberries self-propagate through rhizomes. So you can see there are lots and lots of stems. Uh, this was originally just two little stems of sunshine blue. And over the course of about seven years, it has developed into a thicket of blueberries. We have, we probably get five or six quarts of, uh, of blueberries you know, over the course of uh, the harvest. You can do just, just wonderful fruit, beautiful pink flowers. Uh, can't recommend a blueberry more highly uh, for San Francisco if you remember to acidify the soil. You gotta keep that pH low, down in the uh, low to mid sixes. We've got uh, a row of cane berries against the fence, uh, mostly golden raspberries pictured here. We've also got some red raspberries and some thornless blackberries. Uh, the flavors are so unique to, to all of them. I, I, if I had to pick a flavor, it would be the red raspberries. They're like candy, but the golden raspberries are, are also uh, very impressive. It's a more delicate uh, raspberry flavor, and, and they're also a more delicate fruit. They're, they're, they're quite fragile. So you need to, uh, it, it, it's, it's tough to find the perfect time to pick a red raspberry, a, I'm sorry, a gold raspberry, because when they reach that orange stage that you see in that middle fruit, they just fall off all by themselves. Uh, this photograph was taken just seconds before that fruit actually fell. It was hanging on by a thread. Uh, red raspberries tend to uh, hang uh, on the uh, on the vine uh, even beyond ripeness into into rotting, so you don't have to worry about them falling off. And uh, blackberries uh, are kind of in between. You, you need to pick your blackberries at at peak ripeness. If they get a little bit overripe, they will fall off, and uh, and they will stain if uh, if you've got. Uh, uh, any substrate uh, that will uh, uh, be affected like, uh, like stones, uh, pavers, concrete. Uh, we don't have that problem. We've got uh, all our pads are covered with uh, bark. Lemon, so our lemon is a Meyer improved. I keep it pruned. It would, it would be three times the size that you see there if I didn't prune it. Uh, even at this small size, seven or eight feet, more fruit than we could possibly ever use. We give lots of lemons out to our friends and family. It's just, it just, it doesn't even have a season. It's just constantly flowering and fruiting. Uh, let me entertain that uh, comment or question that you had about lemons earlier. Okay, the question was, I have a large Meyer lemon tree and a large Eureka lemon tree. Do you think I can graft on a lime or a grapefruit? or some other citrus? Yes, you could. Uh, but um, I would caution about, uh, you know, grapefruits or pomelo because that's a big fruit and the, uh, the structure of a lemon tree might not necessarily support such a, such a heavy fruit. But uh, yeah, you can, uh, uh, citrus will accept grafts. Uh, it's compatible with uh, all other citrus. I would caution you though, that we are still under quarantine and it is illegal to, uh, to move uh, citrus vegetative matter uh, from one part, from one area to another. Uh, you can order uh, clean certified uh, budwood uh, from UC Riverside uh, in order to do your grafts, but please do not share cuttings or buds with your friends, family, neighbors, or master gardener colleagues. We're trying to stop the spread of uh, HLB disease. 
which of course is transmitted by the Asian uh, citrus psyllid. Uh, a cure has been found for this disease recently by UC Riverside. And uh, curiously enough, it's a, uh, a protein, a peptide produced by none other than the Australian finger lime tree. So not only is the Australian finger lime resistant and maybe even immune to HLB disease, but uh, a, uh, a protein that is extracted from the fruit is, uh, has been found to cure HLB. And uh, you'll be hearing more about this as time goes on because uh, they need to start uh, figuring out how to uh, inoculate trees uh, with this uh, peptide and uh, how to uh, properly treat them to uh, recover all the infected trees in Florida and California. But for now, the quarantine remains and you should not be sharing moving uh, vegetative matter from citrus trees amongst yourselves. All right, so moving to the last section of the garden now, the uh, back section of the west one side. More, one more lemon question. Yes. Um, I have a, the question is, I have a Meyer lemon so prolific it is leaning into the driveway area. It has too much fruit. I was planning to cut back or or tie it back. What's best? Well, uh, going forward, thin your fruit. Don't let it make all that fruit. You know, I, I know it's painful to even consider because we all love our fruit trees and we love our fruit, but you know, you need to pay attention to the structural integrity of the tree. If the, the fruit trees will produce more fruit than their branches can hold, that's just what they do. And it's up to us as stewards of the tree to uh, protect itself and uh, thin the fruit to make those branches less heavily weighted and that'll prevent it from leaning. So for now, uh, what I would do is, is get in there and uh, take off like half the fruit, you know, do some pruning of the more delicate branches, stake it to, uh, to get it back to the, uh, the true vertical and, uh, you know, maintain your uh, pruning and fruit thinning regimen until the tree is mature enough to, uh, to uh, support structurally a, a heavier load. So uh, close to the house on this side, uh, we've got uh, a little uh, sweet potato experiment, the uh, honey mandarin and my babaco. So I'm sure you've all experienced uh, buying uh, sweet potatoes in the store, bringing them home, putting them on, uh, on the kitchen table to store or maybe in the crisper bin of the fridge and a couple of weeks later they start sprouting. And you've probably been tempted to just uh, take that potato and stick it in your garden. That's not the way it works with sweet potatoes. If you wanna propagate sweet potatoes, what you do is you let that sprout grow till it's like six or eight inches long and then you cut it off of the tuber. Then you root that cutting, which we call a slip, just in water. Once it's fully rooted, the way you see in this photograph, then you can put it in the ground. And the best time to put it in the ground is uh, autumn. If you put it in the ground autumn and let the vine grow, it'll concentrate on making a tuber. If you were to do this in the spring or summer, it would concentrate on making flowers and seeds. So for us, it's an experiment. I don't know, you know sweet potatoes and yams are tropical and uh, they might not make a tuber here in San Francisco, but I've got one in the, I've got two in the ground uh, growing happily and we'll see what happens in a few months. Hey, Puscat. This is another uh, big box store find, California honey mandarin. The, uh, the fruits of the California honey mandarin, kind of small, by uh, tangerine standards, kind of seedy by tangerine standards. But uh, everything I've read about it is that uh, they're very, very flavorful. So I found it at, uh, at Home Depot and said, what the heck? Uh, it already had some flowers and little baby fruits on it. So it was uh, certainly precocious. It was a tiny little thing, probably just a, a two-year-old sapling. You can see the, uh, the graft union down towards uh, the bottom there. 
and uh, we actually had some tiny little fruits that got uh, ripe and were eatable uh, this past year. Uh, they were really small though. I mean, like the size of maybe, maybe twice the size of a kumquat, you know, really small, like half the size of a, of a, uh, of a, a store-bought tangerine. I'm hoping that as the tree matures, we'll get bigger fruit, but uh, we'll find out. Babaco. Babaco is a seedless hybrid of mountain papayas that uh, grow natively in the central highlands of Mexico. Uh, because it is a hybrid, uh, it, is, it is a mule. Uh, because it's seedless, the only way to propagate this is from cuttings. Uh, we get up to two dozen fruits each year, and the, the biggest ones can weigh up to two pounds. Here in San Francisco, it behaves deciduously, drops all its leaves during the winter. The fruit hangs on the bare tree. It looks like something out of a Dr. Seuss illustration. And uh, by late spring, they, you can see here in the, fit, in the picture, they start uh, turning yellow and ripening. Uh, that bottom fruit there that's half yellow, uh, I would pick that at that stage and let it continue ripening to full yellow indoors. Because if you allow babaco to ripen all the way to full yellow, they will drop off the tree and they're very fragile. When they drop off the tree, they'll split open or uh, you know, like half, half of it becomes mush. So I like to pick them when they're about half yellow. This tree is about 16 feet tall and uh, yeah, it's a pretty amazing tree. If you look up into the sky, this is a good illustration of what we mean by being in the fog transition zone. And this is a very common occurrence where we live in the Excelsior. You look straight up and you see this, this turbulent intermixing of the dry inland air with the, uh, with the wet, uh, heavy fog from the coast. And uh, you know, this, is, this is very common for, for where we live. Where I live, you can walk five, six, seven blocks in either direction and either get into the sunshine or go into deep cloudy fog. We're right on the border. We can take questions now. Um, yeah, one person had a lemon question again. Mm -hmm. it says, do you have problems with rats eating the bark and fruit of your lemon trees? Yes, uh, not the bark, but uh, I have found that rats like to gnaw on the rind of the lemons. Uh, you know, we've been here, what, 16 years, and only in the past two years have we had rats. Uh, and ra all our neighbors have them now, too. We had to hire Pacific Coast Termite to uh, exclude the rats from the house. I, I was starting to find rats in the garage. And uh, what they did was they sealed up all the holes and crevasses where rats were getting into the house to exclude them. And uh, uh, I've had several different uh, rat trap experiences. Uh, the first thing that I did when I found them in the house is I bought something called a rat zapper, which electrocutes the rats, worked real good. Uh, then I started trying the rat zapper outside and uh, got some really big ones. It was like, uh, you know, I've got some pictures up on Instagram where I quote uh, Roy Scheider from uh, Jaws, where he says, uh, you're going to need a bigger boat. I've got a really big rat that barely fit in that trap. But uh, the rat zapper is designed for indoors. And uh, I went against the rules and, and put it outdoors and it shorted out from the moisture in the air. So, uh, you know, don't spend the money on a rat, on a rat zapper if you're going to use it outdoors. It'll short out. It's not designed for that. Uh, Pacific Coast Termite turned me on to these uh, spring traps uh, called uh, T-Rex. And uh, I found that baiting the T-Rex traps with uh, peanut butter is very effective. Uh, I've caught, I've killed a lot of rats with the T-Rex. Uh, we've also got a Cooper's Hawk that uh, claims our yard as part of his territory. And... Uh, you know, I suspect that he's kept the rodents down a little bit, but uh, the Cooper's hawk seems to me to prefer pigeons as his main diet, but uh, couldn't hurt. Uh, there are a lot of feral cats in the neighborhood, as I said before, but uh, 
you know, cats generally are not going to mess with rats. Rats are just too big. Cats will, are very effective against moles, uh, voles, mice, but uh, rats are a little bit out of the uh, out of the question for a cat to handle. But uh, yeah, we've got rats, and they love to gnaw on the rind, and there's nothing you can do about them uh, except uh, kill them all off and get your neighbors to kill them all off. Because just because you're trapping rats doesn't mean that your neighbors don't have a nest in their backyard and uh, allowing them to uh, live. You gotta, you gotta band together with your, with all of your neighbors to uh, keep, uh, keep things clean and, uh, and uh, exclude them and uh, remove food sources. But unfortunately, our, our fruit and veggie gardens are food sources. And uh, I don't think once they're here, we'll probably never fully get rid of them. Someone suggests a have a heart trap, which I don't Not think rats. Supposed to use, yeah. Have a hearts are great for uh, for squirrels, uh, but the problem with have a hearts is that uh, so what do you do with it once you live trap it? Uh, there are some very very strict rules in California about relocating uh, captured animals, and uh, you should do your research on what your local authorities say about relocation with uh, have a heart traps. Uh, uh, I will tell you that with squirrels. Uh, if it were legal to relocate them, which it is not necessarily, uh, you would need to move a squirrel at least five miles away. Uh, otherwise it's gonna find its way home. Uh, and, and then there's the ethical question of, okay, so you relocate an animal and now it's gonna bother somebody else. And then the uh, ultimate ethical question is, you trap an animal live, what are you gonna do then? You gonna kill it? Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, if, if, I'm, if I'm working with rats, I'd rather the killing be done automatically by a, by a snap trap. I don't wanna to have to be drowning or you know, otherwise murdering uh, varmints, but personal choice there. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert on uh, vertebrate pests, but we've got lots of UC uh, ANR uh, literature available to you online and we've got several experts uh, in the master gardeners who uh, can help you in your battle against vertebrate pets, pests, especially gophers. That's the end of the questions in the chat. Um, I did post all your links in the chat at the end again so people can see them. And I want to thank Bruce. Uh, Bruce, that was incredible. I couldn't even tell you how many notes I have taken. Ah, thank and, you. And if um, anybody had any further questions or as you're doing your research, as I know that I will be doing, I hope that um, uh, I will, I'm, uh, one of the things I'm going to do is look at, uh, San, uh, what is it, California Rare Fruit Growers uh, yes. to, to look at and to explore some of these plants you mentioned. And also you can uh, direct email Bruce or you can um, put some questions up on collaborative tools if you'd like to, to share your questions and, your, and his answers with, other, with the rest of our master gardeners. Also, you know, he has a, a great Instagram account. That's what made me uh, want for, I, you know, curious about his whole garden uh, and it's at San Francisco Fruit Gardener if you do Instagram. So I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, this was really fascinating and um, very informative, Bruce. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks all the Master Gardeners who uh, signed up. I know that you all are going to be doing some researching yourselves. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Peggy?